having the keys to your coins yeah. is critical. It's absolutely yeah. critical. And that's, you know, by the way, as we talk people into buying the ETF to get them started, you know, the next talk, the next talk is a self-custody talk. Yeah. Because the ETF doesn't solve that. It's no, a, no, it doesn't. But but like you said, it can pique people's interest and get them well, that's start the, going that's down the, the rabbit well, and, hole. And there are certain pools of capital, as you say, starting a self-directed IRA is hard. Yeah. There's certain, you know, I mean, I, I even have some legacy IRA 401k stuff and, you know, hey, okay, fine. I It, it would be hard for me to get that to where I want yeah. it to be to buy the... I've got a lot of you know coins I have the keys to, so I just said, fine, I'm going to buy the ETF. You know, it's like yeah, I got exposure to the price there. It's a small percentage of my holdings, but it's it, you know it's there. Larry Leopard emphasizes the significance of self custody, highlighting the limitations of Bitcoin ETFs as a complete solution. While ETFs offer a gateway to the crypto world, they fall short in providing full control over your investments. This is crucial because true ownership in the crypto space means holding your keys. Let's break down why this is vital. Owning your keys means you're not just a passive participant in your financial future. You're actively securing it. With major financial institutions and legacy systems, your assets are under the stewardship of third parties, which can lead to complications or risks, especially in volatile markets. By holding your keys, you ensure that you have the ultimate say over your investments, free from the risk of institutional failure or interference. Think of it as the difference between renting a house and owning one. Which position would you rather be in when it comes to your financial security? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button to stay updated with our latest content. Will we see a, a country go back on the gold standard or on uh, the Bitcoin standard first? Ooh, that's a really tough call. I probably think the Bitcoin standard first. I think that... Um... You know, they're, they're t we're talking about two different sets of countries, right? The, yeah. the bigger, more powerful countries aren't ready and aren't going to go to the Bitcoin standard. Um, you know, if they try to reset, if China or something tried to reset, they, in Russia, maybe, they would be more inclined to go to gold because they hold a lot of it, et cetera, et cetera. The way the game theory is set up, I mean, the smaller countries have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a surprise that a very small third world country was the first adopter. You know, there was there was nothing but upside here. Well, especially because they had already given up their own currency. They had the dollar, there so were, it wasn't even competing right. with their own currency. Exactly. I think we will see some more small countries um, make this flip. I mean, I was disappointed recently to say, see Malay in, in uh, Argentina doesn't fully understand the difference between crypto and Bitcoin. I mean, and but but I mean, there's a candidate for maybe eventually flipping yeah. in our in our favor, or you know, I mean, in Ecuador or Colombia, or you know, I mean, it's. I think we will see other countries adopting it. Um, you know, perhaps some of the countries over in Eastern Europe. Um, you know, I think a couple of those kind of kind of get it. Uh, you know, we'll have to see. Um, but even if no other country adopts it, I think the more important thing just is as as number go up and as it becomes more and more of a, a stable reserve asset and as volatility goes down and the volatility is going down. Um, you know, it's just I mean. It's going to be just more and more common to to own this stuff. And the other thing that I would point out that I just think is really important for everybody to focus on is just the macro picture of how early we are and how big this could be and where it could go and why. Well, it's crazy how it lines up too with the decisions the U.S. government's making and well, how they are just. It, it seems like before they could maybe always pull back. Now it's like oh, yeah. I don't see any. We path we we, back. Have, we have totally crossed the event horizon yeah. of 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 sound money. I mean, the only chance they would ever have of getting us on, back on the right path would be to try and do what Paul Volcker did, which is really increase interest rates, really cut spending, balance the budget. But even and, with but with the government debt level that well, is, that's is, my I don't, point. I don't, I don't, that's my it's point. If they, if they do that, then the then the interest yeah. costs balloon, and then we have an enormous recession and. I, yeah, I think you're right. I, I mean, I think we've cro we have crossed the Rubicon where there is no going back. And so now the only thing that's uncertain to all of us is, you know, at what rate and in what bumpy fashion do we go forward with, yeah. more, with more monetary debasement? I mean, you know, you can, I, I love looking at the Fed balance sheet. It was 800 billion, you know, before, um, before 2008, you know, and it bumped up on that to, you know, 3.7 at the high, came back in a bit, and then it bumped up to nine, it's coming back in again. I, mean, I think the next bump takes us to 20, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's kind of logical. I mean, Lynn, Lynn Alden has a great chart in her book that shows that, how the, you know, the, the base money supply has to be available to support the debt. Without growing the money supply, you know, the debt starts to default, which, you know, you could have that. That's the 1930s. Yeah. That's a deflation. That's a depression. 
And, and that's always a possible outcome. I mean, I never... But, but I just don't think they have yeah, the stomach for that. Well, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's always a possible outcome, except that consider we're dealing with politicians yeah. whose job is to keep kicking the can, if they can. And the easy... I the, think they think they were successful in COVID. I think... Oh, absolutely. They took the exact opposite lesson from it. Absolutely. It they're worked. They're thinking MMT works. Oh, absolutely. I think that's absolutely right. But... Remember, they do, they do react to the, the body politic and what the body politic is saying. And the body politic is pretty friggin' pissed off about inflation. Yeah. Pretty friggin' pissed off. I mean, everybody, there isn't a person, to a person in this country, I mean, pre this whole event, there was, I mean, we said inflation, everyone was like, ah, whatever. Yeah. You know, there's a little bit. I mean, it was no big, I mean, you, you know, I mean, I, I think you talk around, you look around, you know, tables of families throughout this country. I can't imagine there's a family that's not talking about inflation and what a problem it is. That's a big deal. I mean, the politicians are going to have to deal with that. I mean, they're going to, you know, they're going to, um, and they're trying to deal with it. You know, they're trying to pretend like they're dealing with it. But I think before you know, they were impacted by it and they knew they were because of the housing market and everything that they felt like I'm falling behind where my parents were at this time. Right. But they didn't see it at the grocery store. Right now, they've got both at the same time. They still can't afford to buy a house or yeah. live in anything decent. Oh, I, and now they can't afford groceries. I've got three kids in their twenties, and I mean, they're just looking at me like, "Dad, we're screwed." I mean, you know, they're, they're all doing fine. Yeah, they're yeah. all finally paid, not excessively, but they're fine. But you know, the, the notion like of in buy, the previous generation, they yeah, would have been definitely you know, go buy a the, buy, buy you know, a house, middle buy, class yeah, house, buy, and, even yeah. buy a car. I mean, yeah. it's like the, you know, it's like no. You know, I mean, they're they're really they're pinched. They're really really pinched, and um, and that's that's playing itself out all throughout the country. I mean, everybody's feeling the same the same level of pain, and and unless you're on a Bitcoin standard. Well, that's right. Unless you're on a Bitcoin standard, <laughs> in which case everything's getting cheaper. I love that meme that somebody put up on the web where it showed or on Twitter where it showed the cost of a house in Bitcoin, right? And yeah, Preston like, and I were talking about that yesterday. Were you, it's yeah, like, it's like. House, just, housing prices are crashing. Yeah, you know, house, yeah, the housing, the, 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 the fiat price of the houses have gone up. <laughs> and, but the, the, the Bitcoin price of the houses have gone down yeah. substantially. I mean, it was like, you know, 30 Bitcoin to 15 Bitcoin to like 4 Bitcoin to buy the average house or whatever. I mean, it's really quite amazing. So it's, it's definitely a better savings technology. And, and I, I love that meme too, because I think that's something that people that, they're not, they don't care about finances. They don't care, you know, talking about Bitcoin. They're like, eh. but you show them that, they're like, yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, this is why I can't afford a house. But right, these people can. Like, yeah, it's, it's yeah, a it's, a, it's like yeah, it's a it's a it's a big difference. And and as I say, more and more people are going to wake up to it, and and they are waking up to it. I mean, we see that every we see that every day. So, and it, to me, it's an exciting time because I think we're kind of. Preston and I were speaking about this on yesterday. I think we're kind of at the elbow of that curve where this is really about to go bigger mainstream. You know, if you look at, you know, the adoption of cell phones or the adoption of any new technology and any new innovation, you reach an, a point in the S-curve where the adoption really starts to grow rapidly. Yeah. I feel like we're at that point. As Larry Leopard speculates, the question of whether a country will adopt the gold or Bitcoin standard first is complex. However, the trend leans towards Bitcoin due to its accessibility and decentralized nature. Smaller nations, in particular, find Bitcoin appealing as it offers financial sovereignty without the need for large gold reserves. Countries like El Salvador have pioneered this shift, choosing Bitcoin over traditional financial systems that rely on foreign currencies. This move is not just about adopting new technology. It's about reshaping economic independence. For larger, more powerful countries, the transition to Bitcoin is slower, mired by extensive bureaucratic processes and entrenched financial interests. Yet, as the global economic landscape evolves, even these nations might find a decentralized standard more appealing as they seek to mitigate risks associated with fiat currencies. Thanks for watching Unscripted Crypto. Remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to never miss an insightful discussion. Until next time, keep your investments secure and your mind open.